Uh, another feature of bacteria is that they can form structures called endospores. Uh, endospores form uh, when nutrients become limiting or some other uh, environmental factor um, makes uh, it difficult for the bacteria to grow. So they can kind of hunker down uh, and form an endospore that can resist until conditions change. Uh, and in some cases, the endospores can be very distinctive. What happens is uh, a mini cell wall forms around the nucleoid, protects the, the genome of the particular bacterium. Uh, and in this photomicrograph, uh, these are uh, cells of Clostridium tetani, the causal agent of tetanus, uh, and they form a very distinctive looking shape. Uh, that's thought to have, it's often described as a tennis racket in appearance. And that tennis racket appearance is, you can see the endospore forming around the nuclei. This is the rest of the uh, bacillus. Uh, so diagnosticians uh, could look under a microscope and see this and know that they had isolated uh, this particular uh, bacterium. But many bacteria are capable of doing this, and this is why it's very important to finish a course of antibiotics uh, once you start taking an antibiotic to treat a bacterial disease or illness. Uh, if you don't, the endospores uh, can wait out the uh, antibiotic if you stop taking it and um, they will reemerge and they may develop disease resistance as a result. So. Always finish your antibiotics, even if you're feeling better or see improvement in your condition. Uh, nutritional modes. How do bacteria eat? Uh, as it turns out, the metabolic diversity of prokaryotes is very much far greater than the metabolic diversity of eukaryotes. Um, so what does that mean? It basically means that prokaryotes can eat a lot more different kinds of uh, nutrient sources than eukaryotes. Uh, not just in terms of just food, but uh, they can use um, inorganic substances more efficiently than eukaryotes. Um, and there's a lot of things that prokaryotes can do that eukaryotes just haven't quite figured out. Uh, they can be heterotrophic, meaning feeding on different things. Uh, we are heterotrophs. We have to eat food derived from other living things. We don't photosynthesize uh, or produce our own nutrients uh, without feeding. Uh, autotrophic organisms feed themselves. Auto, like an automobile, drives itself. If something is automatic, it happens by itself. Uh, autotrophic means self-feeding. Uh, and those are typically organisms like that are photosynthetic, for example. Uh, photoautotrophic organisms photosynthesize in the way that you are probably used to hearing about photosynthesis. They, uh, photosynthetic organisms that are photoautotrophic can harvest uh, light energy and convert it into ATP and reducing power and then use that reducing power to fix carbon from uh, the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. There are some organisms that are photoheterotrophic. They can produce ATP, they can get energy from sunlight, but they can't fix carbon. So they have to actually feed on organic carbon sources. Um, and they don't just produce it on their own. In addition, there are some prokaryotes that are chemoautotrophic that are capable of using chemical energy derived from the earth uh, to uh, produce their own um, energy and to produce their own source of nutrition. So at the bottom of the ocean, for example, near thermal vents, there are prokaryotes that can take, for example, uh, sulfides that are emerging, uh, spewing out of the Earth's crust, uh, and produce energy and produce biomass just from those basic sources. So those are the 
the the exception to uh, the organisms that rely upon the sun's uh, light for the ultimate source of energy in an ecosystem. But prokaryotes can do all of these different things. Um, eukaryotes, uh, they can do these first three things. Uh, we don't usually see photoheterotrophs or chemoheterotrophs among the eukaryotes. Uh, as far as oxygen is concerned, if all the oxygen in our atmosphere, which is about 20%, um, were to disappear spontaneously, just overnight, gone, uh, eukaryotes would be in big trouble. Uh, prokaryotes would be okay. There are some prokaryotes that would not be okay, but there are a number of prokaryotes that can exist in the absence of oxygen or anaerobically uh, just fine. Uh, in fact, there are some that are obligate anaerobes, uh, meaning that they cannot exist when oxygen is present in the oxygen gas is present in the atmosphere. So they have to exist in places where uh, there is no oxygen, like in uh, sediments underneath, underwater, um, for example, uh, deep in soils, you can find some obligate anaerobes. And then there are some organisms that are facultative anaerobes, meaning they can survive in the presence of oxygen or without the presence of oxygen. So facultative means uh, it can exist with oxygen or without, in the case of an anaerobiasis. Uh, facultative can also apply to other things uh, like types of nutrients. So apropos of anaerobic respiration, or anaerobic respiration, we use oxygen, we breathe oxygen to accept electrons from our food and that oxygen uh, combines with protons and those depleted electrons and forms water. So when we are breathing out, the oxygen that we breathed in is being turned into water vapor, uh, and the carbon dioxide that we breathe out is coming from our food. Now, the uh, electrons that oxygen can accept can be very depleted in potential energy, which means that uh, aerobic respiration is the most efficient form of respiration in the sense that it produces the most ATP. But there are a number of ways to produce ATP uh, using anaerobic respiration using a different terminal electron acceptor other than oxygen. So anaerobic organisms uh, can use a number of different things like sulfur, nitrate, uh, manganese, iron, even uranium, uh, carbon dioxide, and there are a number of others. Now these are all things that only prokaryotes can do, eukaryotes cannot do. Uh, in addition, there are a number of different ways that prokaryotes can ferment. Remember, fermentation is the process that keeps glycolysis going by removing electrons from NADH. And it produces a number of different byproducts like lactic acid or ethanol, uh, but Bacteria, prokaryotes, have a number of other ways that they can ferment and another, other places to sock away those electrons from NADH so they can produce that NAD plus and keep glycolysis operating. And a number of those uh, products that they produce give flavors to some of our fermented foods, things like yogurt and kimchi uh, and different types of cheeses and um, wines. Uh, so as far as what they eat, this means that there's a number of different ecological relationships. There, uh, we typically think of bacteria as being bad guys. We hear about bacteria and our first reaction is sort of uh, one of disgust or distaste. That's because the most famous bacteria are the pathogenic ones, or the ones that cause diseases. And there are a number of very bad uh, pathogenic bacteria that will kill you if you are exposed to them and, and you don't get medical treatment. Uh, historically, bacterial diseases have killed uh, legions of, of people, 
wiped out large swaths of the human population at different time points. And it's only in the era of having useful antibiotics that uh, we don't have to worry as much about pathogenic bacteria because we have ways of treating them, but uh, as antibiotic resistance develops and more and more strains of bacteria because of the overuse of antibiotics, uh, we could be heading for a day where a lot of bacterial diseases uh, make a resurgence as a, a source of uh, morbidity or increase in death rate in human populations. However, it is the small minority of bacteria that are out there that are actually pathogenic or disease-causing. Uh, there are a number of other ways in which bacteria can derive their nutrition. Uh, they can be free-living, meaning they can just be uh, living without a host. They're not dependent upon you or me or your cat or dog or your, uh, your garden plants for a source of nutrition. They can get it from their environment, uh, which is just out in the world, maybe in the soil or in a body of water, the ocean. There are a number of bacteria which are mutualistic. Mutualistic bacteria provide a benefit to their host, and the host provides a benefit to them. I'll give you some examples in a minute. Uh, a number of bacteria are famous for being decomposers, for cycling nutrients, taking nutrients that are locked up in uh, the biomass of no longer living organisms, and returning it to a form that other organisms can use. Uh, biofilms are an area of research that is uh, becoming more and more popular as we learn more and more about how biofilms operate. Uh, biofilms are typically uh, groups of different species of bacteria that uh, are capable of uh, using each other's waste products as the starting products for other organisms. So it's kind of like uh, a biofilm is kind of like a slimy village of bacteria where one organism may start with something like uh, a mineral like nitrate. It produces nitrite as a waste product. Another organism might use that nitrate, nitrite to make ammonia. Another organism might use that ammonia to uh, fuel some other process and so on and so forth. But then you take one of the species of bacteria out and you culture it and it doesn't behave the same way at all. Um, so biofilms are very interesting, very important. Uh, biofilms are being talked about right now in uh, reference to the, uh, the, the water supply in Flint, Michigan and the lead poisoning incident that's going on up there. Um, so biofilms, very active area of research. Bacteria are also important because of endosymbiotic theory. Uh, endosymbiotic theory, hopefully you recall, is the idea that uh, our organelles, our mitochondria and the chloroplast of plants and algae were once free-living uh, prokaryotic bacteria. <clears throat> so some of the lines of evidence for that include um, the fact that uh, mitochondria and chloroplast have their own DNA and ribosomes, uh, that the architecture of those DNA and ribosomes is more like prokaryotic uh, DNA and ribosomes than it is like eukaryotic DNA and ribosomes. They have a an external membrane layer, uh, sort of the remains, the vestiges of a vacuole that may have engulfed those uh, organelles. And we have still living bacteria or extant bacteria that bear similarity to these organelles. In the case of mitochondria, there are alpha proteobacteria which uh, are capable of oxidative phosphorylation, have very folded up membranes. Uh, in the case of chloroplasts, we see similarity to uh, still living cyanobacteria, or photosynthetic, uh, photoautotrophic bacteria.